Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And Amanda, we've talked a lot about various different creatures that we've seen not only around the world, but in pop culture, in fantasy, in all different types of media. We've talked about werewolves, we've talked about vampires, we've talked about dragons, all sorts of creatures, right? But one that we haven't talked about much on the show is the unicorn. Now, Julia, have you been avoiding this subject out of, um, you know, politeness and care for me? Because early on in the podcast, I firmly asserted that narwhals were fictitious. And you said, baby, baby, they're they're real. And I said, no, that can't be right. I think enough time has passed that we can <laughs> address that and you don't feel like a fool. And yes. that is my kindness to you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I'm learning along with everybody in the audience. It's been eight years. I'm I'm you know, that the distance between when we started Spirits and now is the distance between us starting high school and uh, finishing it. So uh, maybe or maybe mid midway through high school. So um, A, that's nuts. And B, I've grown. Yeah, that's fair. Hey, listen, we've all grown here. The show has grown. We've done 372 episodes. Well, this will be 372 episodes. We're all here to learn. We're all here to make mistakes and grow together, you know? I'm into it, and I'm excited to learn about these sparkly extra horses. Well, Amanda, there is a lot to discuss about unicorns, but what is kind of the classic image that you picture in your mind when you think of a unicorn? Oh, sure. Mine is going to be the Avalon books, which were a real bisexual touchstone for me mm -hmm. and I know for you. Mm -hmm. Um a, a like pure white horse, a real kind of like Arthurian legend, like English uh, folktale vibes, um, very much like pure, something around, you know, they can only be like ridden or tamed by virgins. That's a trope I've heard a lot. Uh, unicorn like fur or hair or certainly their horn or even hooves um, being, you know, magical and having good properties. And what else? Um, I know that some of them can be pretty bloodthirsty um, and some of them can be pretty sweet. But the sort of like, you know, uh, little girl, uh, you know, brushing the mane of like a white unicorn doll is what comes to mind most. OK. And that would be completely valid. You know, the the modern unicorn is very much like very much inspired by these kind of European literature and art forms. Right. But the origin of the unicorn actually dates all the way back to 2000 BCE and not just in Europe, but also in the Middle East and Eastern Asia as well. So, Amanda, as you kind of described, unicorns are, in case anyone doesn't know what we're talking about when we talk about a unicorn, they are a horse-like, though sometimes goat-like creature with a long, straight horn. This is kind of the really classic Middle Ages and Renaissance version of this creature. I think what would be best, though, is if we start with the oldest version of the unicorn so that we can kind of have the opportunity to see how it has changed and transformed over time and across various cultures. So we will start with the Bronze Age in the Indus Valley, where the unicorn is a bit less of a horse and more like a steer or a cow. It's distinctly bovine, hmm. which, Amanda, I know you uh, you love a cow, right? I do. I, I love a cow. Uh, there was like a cow hanging up uh, in my in my nursery growing up, a, a painting of one, to be clear. Uh, and I've always had cow stuffed animals. So they're they're very close to my heart and makes sense given the livestock that people interact with day to day. Yes. And so for the Indus Valley, this image, again, it's very different from the Middle Ages version that we've been talking about, which is more of the like single horn that goes straight out. But the Indus Valley version is a single horn that is curved as opposed to the kind of this straight but sometimes spiraled medieval unicorn. Oh, sure. Like a steer, like a bull, like all kinds of mountain goats. Exactly. Exactly. So what we know about the Indus Valley unicorn is mainly from art. So they are featured pretty prominently on several soapstone stamp seals from this time period. And archaeologists have even found like small terracotta unicorns that they've concluded are probably toys or some sort of decor. They're just like me, Julia. Listen, little kids have been playing with unicorn dolls for literally millennia. Incredible. Isn't that amazing? 
So we don't know a ton about the characteristics of the unicorn from this period, though it's believed that there's two kind of theories of thought here. It's either they were some sort of religious significance of a creature, or more likely they were a symbol of some sort of like merchant community or guild or a powerful family. Makes sense. Because like if they're having seals and stamps kind of carved for them, they're probably doing some sort of business. So it's either a rich family a la succession or it is like a guild is like, ah, yes, we're part of whatever the unicorn represents guild and stamp approval. Yeah, you're not going to carve a stamp like for funsies. Uh, You're going to have it to mark something meaningful. So we don't know a ton about the Indus Valley unicorn. All we really have remaining is art. And some scholars believe that they don't actually have much tie to other versions of the unicorn that we'll talk about in this episode, as this version of the unicorn really disappears at the end of the Indus River civilization period. But I did think it was worth discussing, if only because it is the oldest version of the unicorn out there that we know about. And I love cows, so perfect combination. Perfect combination. And Amanda, we're a podcast that talks about mythology. But if you were to talk to someone in ancient Greece, they wouldn't tell you stories or myths about unicorns. Rather, they would want to discuss with you natural history. Oh, really? Was the unicorn meant to be like an extinct species? No. So the unicorn was meant to be a species that you would find in another country. Like we would talk about like the okapi, which is also known as the African unicorn. Oh, really? I did a book report on the Okapi in uh, in third grade. It's been close to my heart ever since. We love an Okapi. Yeah. People like genuinely thought that they were unicorns. Yeah. It's pretty cool. No one could find them for so long. Yeah. They were like, oh, yeah, the Okapi exists. And white people were like, no, impossible. Classic. But the Greeks, as we know, kind of make a distinction between myth and religion as opposed to creatures that are found in nature. While something like the Sphinx is a supernatural creature to the Greeks that exists only in like stories about the gods and demigods, they genuinely believed that one could find the unicorn if you knew where to look. Wow. And knowing where to look specifically is if you wanted to find a unicorn. Ancient Greeks believed all you had to do was go to India. Oh, they're just like walking all around there. So there was a Greek physician and historian named Chesias who wrote a book about India at the time, though it wasn't based on his own experiences because he had never been to India. Classic. But rather on stories that he heard when he was acting as the court physician for the king of Persia. Oh, yeah. I'm sure people told the king of Persia really accurate and, uh, you know, sympathetic, evidence-based stories about India. Goodness gracious. So in this book, which we will take with a grain of salt because he never went to India himself, he describes a unicorn as being related to wild donkeys that can be found in that region, uh, except that they were very like sure footed and fast and agile. And they had one long horn that was about two feet long. I'm definitely getting the goat connection. So I'm, I'm grateful you started us in the Bronze Age. Yes. So unlike the unicorns that we imagine... The supposed unicorns of Chesius were basically, they weren't just white. They came in red and black as well. And if you were thinking, Amanda, would you want to eat a unicorn? I mean, my like uh, European folklore tells me that would be something blasphemous. So no. Well, it's not so much that it's blasphemous. It's more that the meat was unpalatable to humans because it was too bitter. Sure. But also probably, but I don't know, the Greeks cook goat. Like, why, why not? You just gotta, yeah, no. you just gotta stew it for a long time. Give it a marinade. I guess so. Yeah. Maybe you need to balance something out with the bitterness. You know, yeah. I've been watching a lot of Top Chef lately. I'm sure <laughs> they could have come up with something to eat unicorn with. Unicorn gyro. But he wasn't the only one who was writing about unicorns at the time in ancient Greece. Aristotle mentions it while discussing one-horned animals like Aristotle would. One he refers to as the Indian ass, which we now know is what he thought was a unicorn. And the other is what we now know to be the oryx, which is a type of kind of like antelope creature. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Pliny the Elder also refers to the oryx as one-horned, but more to our specifications. He also mentions what he refers to as the monoceros, which is a fierce creature with, quote, the head of the stag, the feet of the elephant, and the tail of the boar. While the rest of the body is like that of the horse, it makes a deep lowing noise and has a single black horn, which projects from the middle of its forehead. It does just kind of feel like he's describing a goat weirdly. (laughs) We'll get to what he may or may not have been describing in just a second. Oh, okay, okay. 
Plenty's got to get a hand on the ball and he's got to like tear the ball apart and then sew it back together bad and be like, enjoy. As he always does. Uh, Pliny is really kind of the only one that talks specifically about the Monoceros during this period. But later, in the 5th century CE, a merchant named Cosmus Indocoplestus wrote about stories he heard of Ethiopia, which is in the modern-day Sudan. And he heard of a similar creature. So in one of those tales, he says that the beast was invincible, with all of its strength stemming from its horn. It was said when hunters tried to catch it and it was cornered, it would jump off a cliff. However, in doing so, it would turn so that it would fall on its horn, which then absorbed the shock and allowed it to escape unharmed to live to see another day. Uh, bananas. And I don't think landing on a horn goes that way. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. So while these stories are wild and also most certainly fanciful, we can actually assume through the lens of time and biology that the creatures that both Pliny and Cosmos were talking about were probably describing the rhinoceros. Oh, sure. Yeah. The, the feet of an elephant. I'm I'm getting there. And maybe if it's like a very skinny rhino, then it looks kind of like a horse. Yeah. He does describe the body of a horse. And I'm like, plenty. I don't think that's right. Or maybe maybe he had a lot of like draft horses. I, I don't know a ton about the kinds of horses that were common to, to ancient Greece. It's true. That's really funny. The poor rhinos, man. I feel like they, they get so much shit put onto them. They're odd looking creatures if you've never seen a rhino before, right? Like you look at that and you're like, wow, that exists in the world. That's not an alien. Rhinos look like they should be tiny, but they are big, which is <laughs> one of my favorite genres of creature. Mm -hmm. Like you look at his proportions, you're like, oh, chibi, little baby, like a little it's puppy. So squat. But it, uh, they're like, you know, 3,000 pounds and uh, pack a lot of force. Yes. They're like just living dinosaurs, basically. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Amanda, did you know that Judaism has a unicorn? No, I didn't. Well, kind of. <laughs> Let me qualify it. So there are nine references in the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, basically, to something called the Ra'em. All right. It was a creature that was used as a metaphor for strength, basically. A, a fierce, untamable creature that is quick, strong, and has a mighty horn, though sometimes it was described as two horns. Mm -hmm. Now, you're like, okay, well, that's just a, a creature. Sure, it has one horn whatever. And you're probably wondering, like, how does that tie to unicorns besides the horn? Well, it comes down to the King James Bible, mm. which is easily the worst translation of the Bible. That's my hot take. I, I have heard many people agree with you. Basically, this is the through line. So you go from Re'em in Hebrew, and then you get the Greek translation of the Tanakh, which translates Re'em to, you guessed it, Monoceros. Oh. And from there, the Greek to Latin translation changes Monoceros to Unicornus. <laughs> and then King James from Latin to English, Unicorn. I see, man. It's so interesting and so direct. Like, just, just study it in Hebrew, people. You could, the, the truth is right. Like, the word that they chose is right there. It's right there. And I will say uh, there are more modern translations of the Bible that utilize uh, wild ox for Re'em oh, sure. instead of unicorn. And there is some rabbinic debate over what the Ra'em might have actually been. There's got to be rabbinic debate, Julia. If it's in the Tanakh, it's, uh, it's rabbinic debate. Exactly. So the consensus, for the most part, believes that obviously it was not a unicorn, but rather a domesticated kosher creature oh. that was from the time around when Moses would have been alive. Right on. Fascinating. I oh, thought that King James was like, yep, unicorn, that's what it is. Yep. And when you think about when the King James Bible was written and what we're about to talk about in the second half of this episode, it makes sense. <laughs> Everyone was just really into unicorns. But I, I think it's a really fun distillation of the sanitization and making human centric a lot of stuff that does just appear in this knock in the Bible, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, biblically accurate angels, for example, of like, yes, a sphere of eyes. And someone's like, mm -hmm, a blonde white man. Yes, those are the same. Uh, With wings. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> uh, but there's there's a lot more strangeness and contradiction to be found than I think a lot of us grow up just hearing. There truly is. Now, I also think that it's worth mentioning the Qin or the Kirin uh, from China and Japan, respectively, which are sometimes referred to as the Chinese or Japanese unicorn. So 
again, this is a creature that isn't exactly what we think of when we think of the Western unicorn. In fact, this is more like a chimera than anything because it is this kind of hybrid creature with the body of a deer, head of a lion, green scales, and really the only thing that makes it even unicorn adjacent, a long curved horn. <laughs> Right on. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing the, you know, the, the one horn and then some amalgamation of uh, features that you don't really see in any other creature. Um, four-legged, you know, fairly sizable. It makes sense that these are all kind of swirling around similar ideas in different places. Yes, exactly. And unlike for the ancient Greeks, uh, this is a distinctly legendary creature. It was said to make an appearance only when there was the arrival and or death of a great ruler or scholar. Hmm. And whereas we can tie kind of Western unicorns to horses, bovine, rhinos, the Chilean are actually tied to giraffes. Really? I mean, I guess I see it with deer. Mm -hmm. They have distinctly like long necks. They have very graceful movements and they have a bony protrusion coming out of their heads, much like a giraffe does. No kidding. Yeah, in fact, this is such a lasting connection that the Korean and Japanese word for giraffe is the same as their version of the chilin. No way. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? It's also worth noting that chilin do not always have one horn. Sometimes it is depicted as having two horns. Sometimes it's antlers. The kind of unicorn chilin connection is definitely more of a modern one, which means it is time for us to talk about what we consider our modern quote unquote unicorn. But we will do that as soon as we get back from our refill. Let's do it. Hey, this is Julia and welcome to the refill. We're going to start off today as we always do here in the refill by thanking our newest patrons. Thank you so much to Raimundo and Penguin for joining us here. Go to patreon.com slash spirits podcast to join our Patreon as well. And you can join the ranks of people like our supporting producer level patrons, Alicia, Anne, Ariana, Ginger Spurs Boy, Hannah, Jack Marie, Jane, Nieselkins, Lily, Matthew, Nathan, Phil Fresh, Rico Like, Captain Jonathan, Malachi Cosmos, Sarah, and Scott, and of course, our legend level patrons. Audra, Bex, Chibi Yokai, Morgan H, Sarah, and Bia Meup Scotty. And again, go to patreon.com slash spirits podcast. You can get really cool stuff like recipe cards for every single episode, both cocktails and mocktails, as well as our director's commentary, tarot card readings on every solstice and equinox, and so much more. Check it out again. That is patreon.com slash spirits podcast. And of course, I'm going to come in with a recommendation. I've really been enjoying the A League of Extraordinary Women series by Evie Dunmore. It is very fun. It's about like the suffrage movement for women in England during the, I believe, Victorian period. And it is just an absolute blast. It's a fun little romance. They deal with a lot of interesting topics for a romance. And I am on the last book. I'm going to be reading it on vacation when I take my vacation next week. And I am so excited. So that is A League of Extraordinary Extraordinary Women by Evie Dunmore. And hey, if you wish you had more Multitude shows to catch up on, I have some good news for you. Members of the Multi Crew get a whole RSS feed full of bonus audio, including our newest show hosted by me, the Multi Crew Review. Every month, I sit down with one of the other members of Multitude to talk about something that they love and think that you will love too. From video games to albums to activities like gardening, the members of Multitude show their passion and their love for all different kinds of things with the hope that they can introduce you to something that you'll love as well. We just recently did an episode on Love Island with uh, Dr. Moya McTeer of Exolore and Pale Blue Pod. It was such a delight. I did not know Moya was into Love Island. It was so much fun to talk about. And I just recorded an episode next month with Corinne Caputo, also from Pale Blue Pod, about like reality shows as a whole, but specifically Vanderpump Rules. And it was such an awesome conversation. I am not a huge reality TV person, but it was so fun to talk to Corinne about that. So you can get that along with Head, Heart, Gut, which are exclusively for members of the Multi Crew, which is our membership program that supports all of Multitude. Get Multi Crew Review and Head, Heart, Gut, as well as other audio exclusives by going to multicrew.club to sign up today. Now, this episode is sponsored by Brooklinen. 
Resolutions are all about you, and Brooklinen wants to make sure that you're investing in yourself this year, and your biggest self-care investment should be and is sleep. So why not upgrade your night routine now with Brooklinen's award-winning home essentials? I know I snuggle into my Brooklinen sheets every gosh darn night, and it's really nice because not only are they buttery soft, but they also keep me cool when I overheat a little bit and also keep me nice and warm in those cold winter months. So they're doing the best of both worlds here. They really are. And I think that starting the year off right will kind of set the tone for the rest of 2024, which is why you should make that bedding swap that you've been eyeing. Brooklinen's bedding bundles are customizable with high quality sheets, comforters, and much more to make any room feel new in 2024. So start the year off right by investing in yourself with Brooklinen's sleep and self-care essentials. Visit in-store or online at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. And use code SPIRITS for $20 off your order of $100 or more. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N dot C-O-M. Use promo code SPIRITS for $20 off. And now let's get back to the show. Now, Amanda, when you look up unicorn cocktails, there's a lot of rainbow cocktails. There's a lot of sprinkles and candy and overly sweet things. And that's just not going to do for us, right? Yeah, that's not that's not the kind of drink that we typically go for. So I am going to suggest my own little concoction, minus all of the sweetness and the rainbow and stuff. Uh, something a little bit more pure tasting, which will make sense in a little bit. Okay. But my unicorn cocktail includes gin, a little bit of like citrus, like an orange liqueur, some orgette. And if you're feeling really adventurous, I would recommend adding a little bit of like edible luster or glitter to kind of give it that like fantastic edge and vibe. That sounds delicious, uh, like a, you know, a nice gin drink with some sparklies in it, which I'm always for. I Hey, listen, that's the best way to do it. And it does kind of give this sort of when you add the the edible glitter to it, it gives it and because the orgette is kind of like a milky color, it gives mm-hmm. it a kind of like swirling white. It reminds me of like what unicorn blood in my mind would look like, you know? Yeah, like a slightly like like a like a white gel pen, Julia, like a white gel pen. That's perfect. <laughs> Now, before we get back to it, I have, of course, a little game for us, Amanda. Oh, yay. So as we've talked about, unicorns, for the most part, were likely like animals that we know to be real, just seen through the lens of someone who has never seen it before. We've talked about unicorns that were rhinos, unicorns that were giraffes. Now, I want you to play the role of a person hearing an account of a creature that we at one time thought was mythical, but we now know is real. And I want you to tell me what you think that animal is. Does that make sense? Beautiful. Yes. All right. We're only going to do three because a lot of them, like the kraken, are super easy to determine like what the origin might be. Like, obviously, that's a giant squid. But some of these are kind of fun. Love it. So number one, we've talked about mermaids before on the podcast. But have you ever heard of the mermaids that known war criminal and overall monster Christopher Columbus claimed to have seen? No. Yes. So while sailing through the water near what is now the Dominican Republic, he wrote, Yesterday, when I was going down to Rio del Oro, I saw three mermaids that came up very high out of the sea. They were not as beautiful as they are painted, since in some ways they had the face of a man. Uh, Would this be a manatee, Julia? It is, in fact, a manatee. Great job, Amanda. Also, manatees are simply thick. Uh, Leave them alone. Manatees kind of classically are what a lot of people mistook for mermaids or like other kind of like, for lack of a better phrase, sexy sea creatures at the time. So, yeah. Sirens, mermaids. Manatees and I, similar shapes. If you, you know, me and them swimming, we're, we're going to look similar. I'm going to blend in. <laughs> I love that for you. Be like, I just want a T-shirt that yeah. says manatee shaped now. Yeah, I'm not an apple. I'm not a pear. Certainly not an hourglass. I think I'm manatee shaped. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> love that for you. Yeah. All right. The the next one has a visual component, which I'm going to send to you. Check out our Instagram, folks. Sea serpents have been something recorded since people started sailing, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, this particular great sea serpent apparently had washed up on the shore of Hungry Bay in Bermuda in 1860, and a drawing was shared in Harper's Weekly. Amanda, what do you think this is? 
So this is um, a very long serpentine creature with uh, scales along its spine, uh, two little kind of fins by the face, and a traditional like fish-looking face. Um, it does look a lot like the oarfish from uh, Animal Crossing, but I'm going to guess a kind of, is it a kind of eel? Amanda, it's a giant oarfish. Yay! Thank you, Tom Nook. Thank you, Tom Nook. You nailed it. But yeah, the giant oarfish was something that because they typically live in such depths, most people have never seen one alive. And if you do see one alive, it's mostly dying from depressurization, from being too high in the water. Uh, And so this one washing up on shore, people are like, oh, a sea serpent. (laughs) That's so funny, man. I am constantly amazed by the fact that I'm like, oh, yeah, I know that. I know that work of art from Animal Crossing. (laughs) (laughs) Proud of you. Proud of you. All right. And our last one. Amanda, you know the phoenix. Of course you do, right? Of course I do. The bird what's on fire. Yes. And the Greeks believed that this was a mythological bird that would erupt in flames before being reborn from the ashes. Mm -hmm. And here is a description from a Greek writer named Achilles Tatius. Quote, he comes from Ethiopia and is of about a peacock size, but the peacock is inferior to him in beauty of color. His wings are a mixture of gold and scarlet. He is proud to acknowledge the sun as his lord. And his head is witness to his allegiance, which is crowned in a magnificent halo. A circle halo is the symbol of the sun. It is a deep magenta color, like that of a rose, and a great beauty with spreading rays when the feathers spring. All right. All right, guy. Calm down. Um, (laughs) Calm the fuck down, my guy. (laughs) I can't think off the top of my head, but there is definitely a form of, like, I don't know, like like a hen or a parakeet or a parrot. Like, there's there's some kind of bird where I, I remember seeing that, like cute, wispy little crown. Um, Not sure of the name, though. So I think Achilles Tadius never actually went to Ethiopia. So, again, this is one of those situations where, like, he heard it from the grapevine, you know? Uh, And what he's actually describing is a flamingo. Oh, my God. (laughs) Then he really missed the the flamingo's defining feature, which is legs Legs for days. Legs for days. days. Yeah, he kind of missed out on the legs for days. I really like the part, too, where he's like, it's about peacock size, but the peacock is inferior to him in the beauty of color. (laughs) Come on, my guy. But if anyone knows the bird I'm talking about, it has like very like wispy feathers on the top of its head that do make a cute little crown. I'd love to know who he is. Send us pictures of birds that have wispy crowns, please and thank you. I mean, always, always. Oh, Amanda, you did an excellent job. I think two out of three is uh, honestly fantastic. Uh, but let's get back to the origins of our modern unicorn. So the medieval and Renaissance period kind of drew their imagery from both, at this point, biblical references to the unicorn, as well as the antiquity ones like from ancient Greece that we discussed. Now, art from this period depicts the unicorn similarly to how we see it now. It has the body of a horse, though sometimes it's a donkey or goat, and a long spiraling white horn. I also really like the medieval era in particular because it gives it a like a goat's beard. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's honestly kind of adorable and i think i think more unicorns should have beards nowadays yeah but like there there's also that kind of like weird distinction and like weird like gendering of unicorns where they're like all unicorn if you went to a little kid and said all unicorns are girls right they would probably be like yeah but i sort of love that we can embrace the gender fuckery of it and be like yeah give that unicorn a beard give that unicorn stubble give that unicorn a goatee And I don't think that unicorns are gendered in any way. Well, actually, the medieval period and Renaissance might disagree with me. But Julia, it disagrees with lots of things that we know to be true. So I think that's okay. So the unicorn during this time was this kind of fearsome creature. It was raw, it was wild, and it was for the most part untamable. But the first reference to our idea of the unicorn was from a 2nd century CE Greek Christian text called the Physiologus, which used the unicorn as an allegory for the incarnation of Jesus. Because of course it did. Yeah, I mean, 2nd century, they're probably still swept up in Jesus fever. Oh yeah, easily. Very swept up in Jesus fever. (laughs) Europe still swept up in Jesus fever, let's be honest here. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So in the story, the unicorn is trapped by a maiden who represents the Virgin Mary. Ah. Now, this maiden is able to trap the unicorn because the moment it sees her, it lays its head on her lap and falls asleep because it sees her as a pure and trustworthy soul. I see. So the, the virginity shit is in there from the very beginning. 
from the very beginning. Yeah, from this allegory, we get one of the defining features of the medieval and Renaissance unicorn, that it can only be tamed by a virgin. Got it. Even Leonardo da Vinci wrote about what was considered the traditional method of hunting unicorns. (laughs) Everyone knows. Everyone knows. Yes. Quote, the unicorn, through its intemperance and not knowing how to control itself, for the love it bears to fair maidens, forgets its ferocity and wildness. And laying aside all fear, it will go up to a seated damsel and go to sleep in her lap. And thus the hunters take it. Is da Vinci calling unicorns heavy drinkers? (laughs) I I know temperance is specifically like Puritan, you know, U.S. construction, but like, damn. Yeah, you're like, damn, the unicorn be getting drunk every night. Yeah, but Julia, this makes total sense that it that it kind of started as an allegory for Jesus because that makes the sort of virginity thing and the like familiarity and you know supposed like purity and like moral you know highness of virgin women make more sense in context. I was always like, where did this virginity thing come from? Like it just it it didn't to my mind come up in so many other sort of Arthurian. Um, era myths, which is really where I first heard of the unicorn, that now I'm just like, oh, yes, there's at least a source for this otherwise kind of weird feature. Yes. And the Arthurian myths are really interesting because they kind of go along the same lines as sort of like French romantic poetry and lore from that time period. Like there is definitely a connection between those two things. I'm not an Arthurian scholar, so I can't speak to that necessarily. But I do love that the unicorn during that period was used in a lot of like analogy and romantic artwork. Here's one that's my absolute favorite. So this relationship kind of between the the virginal maiden and the unicorn is something that was used by French authors in the 13th century, saying something along the lines of a lover is attracted to his lady like a unicorn is attracted to a virgin. Yeah, a lot of tropes circling around here, but I'm I'm just busy thinking about the women who got a chance to go on the hunt because they needed like the damsel to attract the unicorn uh, and mm-hmm. the women who were very interested in like going out and having adventures and perhaps even in hunting and being like, yeah, uh-huh, I'll, I'll be the bait. Don't worry about it. But they actually get to go, like, go have an adventurous day. I also feel like I would be devastated if I was like, because I'm the kind of person who like if a puppy or a cat comes and sits on my lap unprompted, I'm like, oh, I've been chosen. Yes. Exactly. So I think if I went on one of those hunts and the unicorn laid its head in my lap, I would be like, no one can touch this now. This is my child, my baby, my sweet time boy. Oh, yeah. No, I'd, I'd uh, you know, kill the hunters and run away to the forest. Yes. And then I would just live with that unicorn and, uh-huh. you know, we, we would be uh, companions forever. Yeah. The fae would adopt us like we've always fantasized about. And it'd be great. Yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great. So <laughs> by the time Marco Polo Oy. started writing about unicorns in the 13th century, this kind of lore about the virgins has been well established. So here's here's how Marco Polo describes them. Quote, scarcely smaller than elephants. They have the hair of a buffalo and feet like an elephant's. They have a single large black horn in the middle of their forehead. They have a head like a wild boar's. They spend their time by preference wallowing in mud and slime. They are very ugly brutes to look at. They are not at all as we describe them when we relate that they let themselves be captured by virgins, but clear contrary to our notions. Marco Polo, baby, that's just a rhinoceros. It is clearly just a rhinoceros, my guy. But the fact that he notes the difference from what he expects to the reality is kind of the notable part for us here. We've even got like Shakespeare references to unicorns, uh, such as uh, Timon of Athens, where he goes, Wert thou the unicorn, pride and wrath would confound thee and make thine own self the conquest of thy fury. Mm. Just ugh. everyone's favorite dry political play. <laughs> One of the worst histories probably that Shakespeare wrote. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. Uh, Shakespeare hot take for the episode. You know, we got to always include a Shakespeare hot take. Got to sprinkle them in. Where Mary Wives of Windsor sucks. Continue. It's a bad play that Shakespeare wrote only because Queen Victoria really liked one character and Shakespeare's like, ah, shit, I got to write a spinoff now. Yep. It's the it's the side character spinoff, which, you know, you, you got to write for your bread. I get yeah, it. Yeah, It's a real um, we made a Loki TV series because everyone <laughs> likes Loki. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, during this kind of medieval renaissance period, which is 
quite a stretch, admittedly. We get many portrayals of the metaphorical and mythological unicorn. But we have to talk about the fact that Unicorn Horn, aka the Alleycorn, was very much something that rich and powerful people paid a lot of money for. Yeah, poaching bad. <laughs> so the idea was that the alley corn could be ground down into a powder or into chips and could be used in healing or as an antidote for most, if not all, poisons, depending on who you asked. Not only that, alley corn was used in many royal objects, sometimes used to make royal scepters, sometimes used in crowns, embellishment on swords, etc., etc., I mean, I do kind of love the, you know, for me, somewhat feminine symbol and like certainly a phallic symbol of the like single large horn. People being like, yeah, put that on the crown, man. It, it makes me laugh. You know, I, I can't lie to you. Well, you know what? It was something that they were like, ah, this is a symbol, one of my tie to the holy empire, you know, the divine right of kings. And like, ah, yes, God said that I am allowed to be king. Be and here's the proof. I have unicorn stuff, which represents Jesus. No one else does, do they? And Julia, what typically were they using? Like, whose horns? Ooh, I'll get to that at the end. No, no, you have to find all about the alley cord before you realize what everyone's huffing. Oh, no, it's rhinoceros penis, isn't it? <laughs> it's not rhinoceros penis, don't worry. Okay, okay. So okay. powdered alley corn was considered purifying and not only for illness. Uh, actually, calling back to the physiologus from before, the horn was said to purify water. Quote, but before they are assembled, the serpent comes and casts his poison into the water. Now the animals mark well the poison and do not dare drink it, and they wait for the unicorn. It comes and immediately goes into the lake, and making with his horn the sign of the cross, renders the oh. power of the poison oh, harmless. no! <laughs> oh, no! Wow, I didn't expect the sign of the cross there. It's really interesting when animals are like, yes, and I've accepted Christianity into my heart. I too will venerate Jesus and uh, transmogrify this water <laughs> into wine. But mainly, mainly, it was used for its medicinal properties. We have sources that say that it was used from everything from measles to treating leprosy and even the plague, right? Julia, you might as well. They're not listening to the people who insist on sanitation and good airflow. So, you know, might they as well. They didn't know better back then. I just have to keep telling myself they don't know what germ theory is. They don't know what germ theory is. The, the times that I do romanticize the past or kind of wish that I could, you know, uh, see some previous event in history, I do remind myself that I love to wash my hands. <laughs> and, uh, it, that takes off so much of history from the map for me mm -hmm. if I filter for times in history when people like to wash their hands. I think I would just, if I had to go back in time, and like they had soap, you know, but yeah. like they weren't like washing their hands. Yeah. I would simply be carrying around so much like pure alcohol just to pour on my hands constantly. Yes. I'd be like, bring me your finest spirits. Dunk, dunk, dunk. <laughs> Eat. Now, because this thing is healing anything from measles to leprosy to the plague, it was probably as expensive as you would imagine. So records indicate that during the 13th century, a unicorn horn in a large piece rather than like being ground up mm -hmm. was sold for up to 11 times their weight in gold oh boy that's like more than printer ink yeah that's <laughs> it's just more than printer ink you're exactly right you know those charts that are like most expensive substances by volume and it's like oil blood plasma printer ink <laughs> and typically printer ink is the most <laughs> all right cool good to know good to know well uh, pretty expensive the the unicorn horn um, and as such, most of the records that we have of it are in reference to the rich and more often royalty. We know that it was used in courts to, quote unquote, detect the presence of poison in royalty's food and drink. And we know now, actually, they actually figured it out in the 16th century, that the alley corn was, in fact, the tooth of a narwhal, oh. which is often mistaken for a horn. It is not actually a horn. It is a tooth. And it also shares the same kind of long, twisted shape that is usually in the depiction of a unicorn. Pretty close. Pretty not so bad. Yeah. And also the powdered version was occasionally elephant tusk. Uh, but either way, not actually unicorn, shockingly. Yeah. If, if I were a king that rich, I definitely want the whole piece to have my guy grind and not the, you know, whoever is promising me whatever. 
Well, also having a like long piece was kind of a big deal because again, we're talking about that like purify, like you could just wave it over a person's body and that would cure them, yeah, quote yeah. unquote. Or you can do the sign of a cross over a, a body of water and it becomes palatable. Incredible. I, I don't know. If I were a unicorn, I wouldn't need Christ. Uh, <laughs> that's just my thought. But what if your existence was a metaphor for Christ? Then I'd be like, I'm newer. Right? Isn't the whole thing about the next prophet? Like, come on. But Amanda, why have unicorns captured us so much even now? I mean, we've got so many examples of like, I don't know if the phrase secular unicorn was something that I (laughs) thought I would ever say, but we have a lot of examples of secular unicorns nowadays. We've got My Little Pony. We've got clothing bedazzled with unicorn graphics. You got the Lisa Frank folders of our childhood. How did it continue to be so impactful into who we are nowadays? I mean, does Lisa Frank play a not insignificant role in this? Lisa Frank is a little bit too modernity for me. You ha- Lisa Frank wasn't going back and looking at like 15th century art and being like that. Sure. Girls are going to like that. <laughs> Partially, we have the Victorians to blame and or thank for oh, that. Oh, yeah. You know, Julia, the, the word hyperfixation goes goes around a lot these days. Uh, it can mm-hmm. be very helpful. I think a lot of people just use it to mean interested in. And that's not exactly what that means for, you know, the neurodiverse. Um, but May I say, the Victorians only hyperfixated. <laughs> the Victorians did not have a surface level interest in anything. That is true. That is absolutely true. So the Victorians loved to romanticize the unicorn, mostly after the, and I use rediscovery, but mainly this is like someone saw it in a museum and they're like, oh shit, people are going to love this. I mean, and so pr- pr- like pre- reprinted stuff, right? And also the British but Empire this- is going around like pillaging, stealing artifacts from all over the place. So I'm sure if you were a person benefiting from, you know, museums or galleries or private collections filled with those images, you know, your specific particular mind is blown. This is a series of tapestries known as the Lady and the Unicorn Tapestries. I won't blame it on colonialism because it's France. Just the ongoing sort of like war and imperialist exchange between France and the UK. Or just like when you would send rich sons to go and be like, see the continent. And they would be like, I like (laughs) art. (laughs) Be like, great, go to Paris. Don't be gay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these were a series of six tapestries made around 1500, which depict a noblewoman and a unicorn, as well as some like other animals like a monkey and a lion. But mostly the unicorn's important. As a side note, this is different from the hunt of the unicorn tapestries, which can be found at the Cloisters here in New York City. Oh. So the Victorians were stoked by depictions <laughs> of the lady in the unicorn tapestries. And it inspired a boom in unicorn art and even, apparently, some Victorian unicorn porn. I, Julia, I was going to say, I was debating with myself, like, Amanda, will, will other people find it unusual if you say people have been into bestiality for a very long time? I don't think that listen we did a whole episode (laughs) on like beauty and the beast and its iterations we know people have been kind of into bestiality for a long time there we go i'm glad i'm among a safe company here so there is victorian unicorn porn no i don't have any other information besides that because i did not want to dig further into that google search but it does exist it's out there You make the printing press, Julia, and whatever happens after that happens. (laughs) We can't blame Gutenberg. We just can't. We can't do it. Uh, But nowadays, though I guess not in the Victorian era, (laughs) unicorns are less the object of purity and Christianity that they used to be, right? The unicorn has become a symbol for the LGBTQ community. They've been tied to rainbows since the Victorian era. And so the two are kind of intrinsically linked. Some gay shit. We love that. Exactly. And like the reasons as to why unicorns are some gay shit definitely like differs from person to person who claims that. But uh, like who wouldn't want to feel represented by a creature that nowadays represents like uniqueness and magic and being highly valued, you know? 
Yeah. And I I think there's really a mix of feminine and masculine uh, that people uh, really are drawn to and can play with. Yes, exactly. And I think that it's also very similar to, I think, why a lot of queer people have a strong connection to monsters in horror and like the supernatural genres. Mm -hmm. It's something that is like misunderstood or more than what society sees them as. And I think that's like a really good reason why we should claim the unicorn as something that represents us. Queer folks... Like, if they're going to make us monsters, we're going to claim the monsters. And if they find us monstrous, we're going to call monsters our kin. Yes, exactly. And if they are going to say that we're too hypersexualized or something like that, we're going to claim a creature that used to represent purity and, and, you know, only be tamed by a virgin. Exactly. God, I love it. I'm sure there are people who have done uh, unicorn drag or burlesque performances, and I'm going to look the hell into that. 100%. There's got to be. I can picture it in my mind. So whatever it is about the unicorn, we know that humans have been interested in these creatures since pretty much the dawn of civilization. And the fact that we're still talking about them to this day in this podcast means that there is like something really special about them. And if you have a favorite unicorn story, if you feel personally like connected to the unicorn in some way, hey, let me know. I want to hear all about it. If you go to archiveofourown.org and type in unicorn and something about this has lit up something inside of you, there's a world for you, baby. There's a world for you. don't have to look up the Victorian porn. You can look up the AO3 porn. No, no. There's plenty of modern porn. Literary, artful porn, Julia. Well, the next time that you wander into a grove and see a beautiful maiden just sitting there and want to rest your head against her lap, remember, stay creepy. Stay cool. Stay cool. 